don't know why. And I am live. This is John Reed of Diginomica. And I've got Josh Greenbaum and Jeff Scott with me. And, you know, we are here to make sense of SAP. The funny thing is, guys, I thought we kind of made sense of SAP in July. And now it's all falling apart again. This, this is how quickly these things move. It, it's That's called what keeps this spicy. Yeah, <laughs> full employment and keeps life spicy. Just when it, you thought you've got this under control. Nope. Yep. Yeah, and our, we don't have bots that are ready to handle these questions. So we are still safe from AI for a little while longer. And in July, we talked about Clean Core just for listeners' uh, interest if you want to go back. But now we're going forward. And what we're doing at the moment is we're at this interesting juxtaposition where we're recording, kind of, we have a back to the future thing going on because we have uh, tech ed happening officially next week. This, will, this podcast will come out in the middle. We've all been briefed on tech ed. The NDAs will lift next week. So we're going to talk as if all the things have been announced. But keep in mind, we actually haven't seen the official keynotes and stuff like that yet. So, you know, take that with a slight disclaimer. And uh, also, you know, a lot of stuff has changed. And so there's a few things. Uh, Jeff has had a massive series of events at ASO because I've been watching you on LinkedIn. It's like every other day you're like, you know, get on the tarmac. Hello, somewhere. Paris. Yep, exactly. So you've got a lot of event insights, Josh. You've been digging in pretty deep into some interesting research that I want to talk to you about. And then I've been uh, at a bunch of shows, including SAP's biggest competitors. So we're going to start with some kind of uh, overall kind of lessons of what we've been learning from all of that. And then we're going to head into tech ed and then see kind of our reaction to that. And then the next final phase will be getting into ASA Tech Connect and kind of what we're looking for there, perhaps in the context as well of enterprise architect themes, which are, I think, a really important part of some of this discussion. So anyhow, that's sort of the agenda that we are going to go through. One other thing that's obviously an elephant in the room that I'm just going to name now is that obviously uh, Jürgen Mueller, who uh, played a prominent role in Tekken in the past, is no longer with SAP. That that happened fairly quickly. Uh, for those of you that are looking for a bunch of opinions about that departure and, and the context of that, that's not happening in this show. All, all of us have opinions on that, but we're not going there in this show. However, we will get into some stuff about kind of changing leadership in tech ed and community and some of those related topics. So that's the agenda for today. So with that in mind, I really want to, I got some surprises for the two of you in terms of my event takeaways, which I think you're going to enjoy, but I don't want to start there. I want to start with you. So Jeff, you're the one who has been keeping LinkedIn well, well greased with event updates. So looking back now from all of those events, are there some themes that have really jumped out at you in terms of what the pulse of customers and ASUG members is right now? I think and feel free to share really... any stories that illustrate that too. Oh, absolutely. Because you know, I just hate sharing, John, right? That yeah. it's, not, it's not in my nature. A um, couple of really kind of important things. We queried uh, some of our chapter meetings. I've been in a lot of chapter meetings uh, over the past couple of weeks, and I love chapter meetings. We have 39 of them here in North America because it really gets you connected to what's happening in the local geographies and how they're really interpreting all these messages. And so I, it's always refreshing for me to kind of listen to what's going on, you know, on the front line, so to speak. Uh, of the customer base. And we asked a question in one of the uh, recent chapter meetings about how much do you believe that artificial intelligence, generative AI, will be a part of your enterprise architectures and part of your future go forward strategies? And how much will SAP be a part of that? And to most, almost to a T, everyone said that generative AI will be a massive part of our enterprise data strategy. Either they are mostly bought in or they were totally bought in. There was only like one or two who said not at all. And what was really upsetting about the ones that said not at all is I couldn't get them in the audience to actually say anything more than that. I'm like, I want to hear why you say not at all. And there's like crickets. But everyone else is on the other side of the spectrum, on the other side of the bell curve saying this Jeff, is Jeff, can I just ask real thing. quick, what, what percentage would you say approximately were the not at all group? Oh, it was a tiny percentage. It was maybe two, three percent. Okay. Um, and I'm I'm not giving up on them, John, because I do want. I'm going to keep asking this question. We have got a lot of other stops to make uh, in our fourth quarter popularity tour, and um, I think that I'm going to keep asking that question and see if I get others to say why not. But and just just real quick on that, I think what's interesting about that is like, I could imagine certain folks being down on generative AI, but if you expanded that to include. Do you care about having a data platform strategy? Do you care about having real-time analytics? Do you care about 
you know, making sense of of your transactions and making better decisions. I would expect that number will get even smaller. So it'd be really interesting to find out exactly what the nature of that resistance is, you know? Yeah. So on this particular thing, you know, I, um, there was a number who said they were skeptical, which I think was interesting. And then we said, how, the question was, how important do you think your SAP platform will be in achieving enterprise AI? That was one of the questions we asked. Um, most of them, 90, 90%, 80% were either somewhat important or extremely important um, was where they, where they landed. And then we asked them a follow-up question. Um, how, and I'll come to the follow-up question in a second because it's not as, not as relevant. So that's where they landed. And so when you think about that, that most of them recognize that this thing called AI will have, or enterprise AI will have a significant impact on their SAP uh, platforms, then you really have to come back to, this is my long-winded way back to your original question, then you have to be able to think about clean core. And you have to be able to think about, to me, there's like four major components of this. If you think that enterprise AI is going to be really important to you, it's got to be about clean core. It's got to be about cloud. It's got to be about moving as much as much ownership of code back to SAP, SASE, uh, or SaaS related stuff. And then finally, getting as much customization out of your systems as you possibly can. If you can achieve those four things, of which clean core kind of is a, is a route through all of that, that to me is kind of the impetus of why you need to be thinking about these things. And so I've, I've kind of been flipping the script a little bit, John. And instead of talking about why you should adopt Rise or Grow, really saying if your end state is to think about this modern enterprise AI enabled landscape where you're using these AI tools to get the most out of your, your SAP investment, this is kind of what you're going to need to do. Now, this is not a, a, a just an easy, hey, let's do this one afternoon on a Friday. We'll just whip this up and make it happen. This is a major, major you know, undertaking for most businesses, but that might be the big why. Why would you want to do this? Um, but that also necessitates master data management, archiving, all the other things that you would need to get your data lined up. And I think this is where we're going to see the most challenge around this is we talk about AI as this magical elixir. And to me, the problem is the data. The problem is the data. And if the data is not right, if the data is not accurate, you're very likely to get a lot of hallucinating happening. And I have heard that in some of the um, places I've been and other people, you know, doing presentations, the importance of data. So that's, can I, can I, I need to jump in on this because this is, so, uh, there we I go. was doing so well and now sure. here we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But all right. We know that we know that we can trigger Josh with AI talk. So this is now perfect. We, we've got him well up triggered, already. Josh, have right. I triggered you? I didn't mean to trigger you. No, I am so least. sorry. No, 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 no. And you've just intrigued me. Um, uh oh. So no, here's the thing, Jeff, and I want to I want to know if maybe maybe I can add a, add a nuance to that question next time Ooh. you ask it, which is, how many of you in the room, hold up your hands, please, are looking at AI as Gen AI, Jewel, that kind of thing, versus how many of you in the room think of AI as predictive AI, decision support AI, as things like Ariba guided buying or I, IBP? Because yeah. to me. I have to say, honestly, when I, and I, you know, IDC did a survey I looked at uh, recently that, you know, 85%, blah, blah, blah. This is, to me, unfortunately, a lot of this is sort of tail wagging the marketing dog. That, that the more SAP talks about this, the more people are going to be regurgitating this. And when I sit down with customers, and this is some of the research John was alluding to, and really dig into what do you think AI is? And they, you know, they, they, they start with Gen AI and say, well, aren't you using planning? What about planning? What about, global track and trace. What about these things you're already doing that are actually really good predictive AI that deli deliver real value? Isn't that business AI as well? And sometimes the light bulb goes off. Sometimes they look at me very quizzically. But I, so I, th I think the problem with, because personally, I don't, see the, I don't see the business return in Gen AI. I don't see it happening in the next couple of years, whereas I see huge returns on you know some of the AI that's intrinsic to the business network, really great AI that's been working for years. So that, that's I, my that's my soapbox. Yes, I I will begrudgingly <laughs> just to be sporting. Uh, agree with your point. I I'm trying to test at the moment, and we as ASA are are you're asking what I think are some outstanding follow on questions. I'm worried that we're still very much in a definitional phase, Josh, where if I, if I jump too deep, 
the risk is we're going to confuse versus clarify. So I do think that when you look at some of these other solutions, like to your point, success factors or Reba or Concur, there's a lot of really good and you know potentially AI helpers out there that can help you get stuff done. I mean, you know, clearly one of the best things about AI, and it's not generative AI, is the fact that I can upload a receipt to my expense tracking software that we use at ASUG, and it will fill in all the fields for me. I mean, that's an outstanding use of AI. It's not terribly, yeah. it's not, it's not terribly new because it's been around for some time. Right. Um, and, you know, arguably we've all as customers been using AI for a very, very long time. Um, we're just calling it something different now, which is generative AI. I do well, happen to think, but that is a different AI. That's really important. It is a different AI, but it's the really one that's, different. it's, it's the one that's caught all of everyone's attention. Right. right. Um, it's the one we're all talking about. And it's the one that has been given the most promise without the real realization of the distance required to travel to get there. That's where I think, you know, when when you go back to November of 2022 and ChatGPT and OpenAI come storming into the market and we consumerize a technology and everyone who is anyone says, well, why can't I do this inside my enterprise? Look how simple it is. And you're Remember like- Remember one click? Why can't I have one click in my enterprise? Right. Well, you know, you know. Processes aren't simple. That's why you don't get one. Right. But everyone, everyone assumes they are. Right. So Until why can't I have it? Yeah. But it's the biggest, nattiest problem to solve, which is right. everyone wants generative AI, right? Everyone thinks that they can turn their SAP, you know, architecture into a one-click, one-stop shop where I can type in some cute little phrase into a, into a chat bot and, and, and receive back thousands of insightful answers. And it, I, I don't think that that's in the near-term solution. And I don't John, think you've been Gen trying AI to say something. Solves, so, Gen AI solves my problem of my supply chain problem of where's my stuff and how do I get different stuff to my customer before I lose that contract? That's you not do or don't? I don't think so. No, that's not a Gen AI problem. That's a predictive well, analytics. So, problem. so just just real quick on a couple of things. Um, <laughs> He's trying to we, we, here we go. Well, I, I do because I don't want to have a an hour long AI discussion along these lines. So, yeah, I think right. we've given users a flavor for how we could consume the next hour of our time. But I don't want to do I that. Do. Um, so, but uh, I want to oh, point out. Trouble. I want to. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna bring the bring the whip a little bit. I want to point out a few different things. Um, AI and classical AI you're referring to in Gen AI are not completely different because they all derive from a field of AI that, m called deep learning, and basically all of this technology is somewhat probabilistic in in nature. The difference between the use cases you're describing, Josh, is there's more maturity in those, and they're more embedded in solutions, and so they're delivering better results. Generative AI, for example, I talked with some customers launching some generative AI projects very early days this fall. And so that's the difference is that the return on value can't be there just yet in most cases. And so uh, it's, it's a tricky discussion to have because customers have very pressing business problems that you referred to. So that's kind of what's going on. Now, I think the reason that generative AI, there's a high interest level in that topic specifically is because there's quite a lot of pressure on executives to be able to articulate what the narrative around it is because there's a big consumer adoption factor with generative AI in the way that it tends to make interacting with data more accessible and easier. And so there's a lot of light bulbs are going off around that. So just in terms of kind of framing things, I think that's sort of where we stand. But one of the other overriding things is that customers have a lot on their minds besides AI. And so vendors so far this fall have made two mistakes, in my opinion. One is they have overplayed their hand with AI in general, where customers are already bought in, as Jeff described. So that they're selling it too much when customers are already in evaluation mode. So that's pretty silly. And secondly, they're overlooking a lot of amazing, cool things that customers can do right now that may not touch on AI at all, like wh whatever version of AI. And so this is, I want to get back to Jeff's recap for a moment here before we move on to tech it, because this is the other thing I'm interested in, Jeff, is if, if, if AI and Gen AI were kind of the headline concern, what are a couple of the big undercard concerns? I mean, obviously, S4 HANA migrations is going to be one that, that lingers. Like for me in the shows that I went to, which were non-SAP shows, cybersecurity was clearly the undercard. And talking with customers about managing that and incidents that they were dealing with was one of the, and obviously that's not a big surprise, but what were the other things? Was there a surprise? Were there a couple of other themes that really jumped out at you that really struck you besides the AI interest? Um. 
Let me come back to, if I might, John, just, I, I don't, I want to put a pin in your, because I think I owe you some data. You originally opened up with a data question and I have some data. Oh, for great. You. So we did, okay. we did some research back in February, which seems like a long time ago, but it really isn't. Um, familiarity with, familiar, let me get this word out on a, on an, in an afternoon. Familiarity, still not quite good. With clean core concept has risen dramatically over the last year. 53% of the customers surveyed were aware or extremely somewhat familiar compared to 32% in 2023. So that number has shot up dramatically. So while we all might be somewhat clean core um, dubious or clean core concerned or clean core skeptics, the understanding of that is, in, is increasing amongst the customer base. When asked, when SAP refers to maintaining a clean core, what does this concept mean? 52 selected running the entire business on a standard instance with a minimum of custom code running alongside standard software. So that's pretty good. 52% said that. 30% selected running the entire business on a standard instance with no modifications and customizations. So it looks like we're hunting in the right woods, right? That people are starting to, and customers are starting to embrace this notion that in this future world, standard wins because I can get to innovation faster, right? One of the things that I did also ask across the chapters and you know, this has been something that's plagued us for a community for a long time. While we talk about innovation, most of us are trapped in the lights on model of the current state, right? I would love to do innovation, but I can't get rid of all the emails I'm getting every day giving me fabulous performance reviews on how well I'm getting all this data out of my SAP investment. A little snarkiness for me in the afternoon. But this community does want to get to innovation. They do want to be able to figure out how to unlock these features and functions faster. And they understand that if they are wandering away from standard, they can't get there. And so I'm going to couple that with some other research, right? We did some research on custom code. Nearly 95% of organizations build and run custom ABAP code to the extent SAP software doesn't support it. So 95%, I mean, not a surprise when you think about it, of all customers are running some degree of customized code. Um, and, you know, that's a big number. So there is a lot of custom code out there, which we might call, you know, this, this really nice, you know, factor of technical debt that has to be unwound. So I think we understand where the end state is, understanding that it's going to take us some time to get there. You know, if I can jump in, I mean, to me, the custom code issue is, and this is part of the research I've been doing. I I think that, and, and the clean core issue, I think you're absolutely right. I think that the message about clean core is starting to sink in. And I think that, you know, the customers are really starting to have that nuanced view that in order to get to innovation, I have to have clean core, which is sort of antithetical to how we looked at R3 and ECC, which is I'm going to start with this general purpose tool and then customize the hell out of it to get to yeah. where I need to innovate. Um, but but to me, and this is part of what, what's fascinating about this, when you dig, uh, SAP is always, you know, an onion. You just have to keep peeling the layers, finding out, you know, what, to what's get to the clean core, Josh. You the peel the layer. Core. Well, it's never that to clean. get to that juicy that, clean. Usually, you're core. crying by the time you're, you know, down a few layers deep. You know the problem. You know, so abs you're absolutely right. I, you know, I was going to um, mention, you know, I, I'm doing. I by the time we we broadcast this, I've done a webinar with with a couple of partners one of which is smart shift who did some research Tremendous. research yeah and, and the other shift. basis um and we um you know one of the things that that smart shift folks you know like to talk about is the fact that in, according to their research your research you know that this need for custom code has only grown year over year it's not shrinking and the question then is what do we call custom code and 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 it's it's you know, it's not so much, are we going to do it, but do we need it? Well, we need it because the industry specifics are not there in the standard. Uh, we need to do this kind of connectivity with non-SAP systems. There's a lot of whole good, good reasons for it. And what, what has emerged in, in my digging, you know, very carefully is that, you know, the, 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 there is going to always be this requirement for doing things outside of the clean core. And uh, you do them in BTP um, as a side 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 by side app. You do them on stack in inside S for HANA. That never goes away. And and I think the next level of what is clean core is to really make that understanding clear that you've got to be clean core in order to innovate. But a lot of times innovation is still going to be about 
writing something right for yourself that isn't but but but, Celine, but in a different Celine, kind of way because you can't you right, can't be doing good. on you can't be doing on stack stuff that disqualifies you from future upgrades so services well, partners can. it's what, just that you're going to get yourself in trouble and well right well, how much it, trouble it defeats, is, it defeats the entire it? it defeats the entire purpose of the modern software environment jeff is describing if you don't do it in a way that is much more in collaboration with SAP and partners around conforming to that strategy and making sure that when you upgrade, this shit doesn't break and it doesn't take you months to test it and regression test every single time. So whether you do it on stack or not, you still have to start paying more attention to that. Hello, services partners, wake up call, alarm bells going off. Sorry, Jeff, you were going to say something. I, I don't believe that saying I'm going to eliminate all customizations, which is a nice destination, but largely impractical for every customer, and clean core are diametrically opposed. All clean core suggests is when you write those customizations, you write them in such a way that they can be managed and maintained over time. So if you're going to put those customizations directly into your cloud ERP solution, that's not a clean core answer. I do think that there's a little bit of- Well, there is a way know, to do that on stack that is clean. Right. I, I I do believe that there's the note. Clean core is a destination. It's an ideal. It's it's not it's not something that most customers can achieve tomorrow, right? And so I I think that um, and and you know there's some things about clean core that I'm not so sure I buy into. And I would like there to be a more customer and SAP aligned definition of clean core versus SAP's only definition of clean core, which seems to be moving around a little bit. So as an example, if you're running you know, old SAP GUI, which so many customers are, Fiori is considered clean core. SAP legacy GUI is not. Right. And yet, to me, that seems weird, right? I mean, I understand the notion, but most customers are not tomorrow going to go out and implement Fiori top to bottom across their enterprises. Don't take so my GUI. Don't, don't take my. Don't take my GUI don't away. Don't take my GUI away from me. Who moved my cheese? Um, <laughs> Mama, don't so, take my Kodachrome so away. Are we going I, back I, to an old Paul Simon song? I want to temporarily park a couple of topics, Josh. I want to temporarily park your clean core um, BTP thing to get back to in the tech ed thing we're going to yeah, get yeah, to yeah. in a minute. Um, Jeff, I want to park your um, your your thing around clean core me unmute. discussions for the Tech Connect preview I want to do because it's precisely, I think, along the lines of what I'm going to say, which is we need these discussions to happen outside of a sales context. And so that's why people don't push back on clean core because they feel like it's part of a sales pitch, but it's actually part of a tech technical debt management sensibility that I think we need to have. So we're going to get back to that in the context of Tech Connect where hopefully those kinds of discussions can happen. But before we go to Tech Ed, I just want to share with you all oh. my quick my quick rundown of my takeaways from events so far. You need, uh, a, you need gonna, a drum roll or some sort of build music um, to that, John. I, I have, well, I have crickets. Um, that probably isn't what I... <laughs> no, no, that wasn't what I was thinking initially. But don't do it. Don't do you it. need some sort of trumpet flare. Dun, 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 yeah, dun, I, don't dun. Have, I don't have trumpets. Okay. So I'm just going to give you my, my top four, and then we can move into tech ed. Uh, so uh, my top four from the events I've attended so far. Number one, vendors are overhyping AI agents to the point of absurdity. Uh, one of the aspects I'll point out there is that agents, AI agents are not new. Uh, so, you know, for example, Uber is powered by agents. So, so is Lyft. All of, all of, a lot of our apps do that. So it's like, okay, so what's new about agents exactly? Well, there's a lot of complex decision-making and reasoning BS coming out right now. And a lot of it, I view, is kicking the cans down the road, which really surprised me because a lot of customers are doing cool things right now, so why why are we spending so much time overselling AI? I don't know why. Number two, enterprise architecture matters for better output and results, but how much? So there's so many innovations going on around smaller models, RAG, foundation models, industry LLMs, uh, knowledge graphs, which we're going to get to in tech ed. Number three, customer data matters for better AI, but how much? We're going to find out. And assuming that we do automate more things, what are we going to do with our automation dividend? And why aren't we talking about that? Hmm. So, so much of the, the, the emphasis on AI feels very mechanistic and automated, and it doesn't feel human-centric and empowering. So, so what is our future of work message? And then that leads to my fourth takeaway, which is 
human t- team collaboration and process changes is the underrated story here. Oh, a lot yeah. of companies, a lot of companies are trying to look at AI as as a solution to 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 bad processes. That's not going to work. Uh, it, it doesn't save you from bad processes. It can't clean all your crappy data, although it can help a little bit, and that's getting a little better. So, how are we going to you know get more out of that investment that we've made in our human teams and process changes as well? So, those are my big takeaways from events so far. And if you have a quick comment, we can get to that. But I wanted to kind of frame that up for our tech at discussion. Jeff, your comment. Uh, more of a question for you, John. I mean, I, I tend to think I spend way too much time inside the SAP house and sometimes the air gets a little stale. So when you're out, you know, examining the whole world and out in the, in the mountains and the valleys and the cold of, of everything outside of SAP, anything that you're seeing that you think is remarkably different from the dialogue we've been having inside the walls of SAP? <laughs> uh, you know, honestly, not so much because everyone's kind of struggling with the same set of problems. Uh, you know, everyone's, you know, when you look at the large enterprise, for example, there's, you know, the same integration challenges and the same desire to modernize and serve customers better. I think the same underlying stressors around macroeconomic concerns that we're all dealing with and the same uncertainties. But it is certainly interesting to see, like, every vendor does have some different strengths and weaknesses and pros and cons to their approach. Um, you know, for the most part, vendors are trying to be very responsible with how they're approaching the use of customer data. But there are some interesting nuances. And, you know, for example, I happen to think that some of SAP's competitors have a better answer around pricing and AI than SAP does. So, but then SAP has other strengths that some of those other vendors don't have. So there's a lot of variation on some of the fine print that is interesting. Josh, you wanted to say I, something. I think, I think the fundamental difference, because, you know, I, I do float around outside the bubble too from time to time, is, you know, is... is it's really still hard to get SAP to talk about non-SAP landscapes, non-SAP integration, and name names, and and really go direct to the customer's problem. So it's very, it's always very oblique. Yeah, we have, you know, we have integration, we do that. We have a million APIs, we do that. But I think, I think when I look, at least my take from the outside looking in, you know, the big, the big competitors are much more open to that. Still, I would say, you know, uh, CX Live is a good example of that inward facing view that SAP maintains to its detriment, in my opinion. I think they really have the chops to be able to talk about serving a more heterogeneous customer base, which is who, you know, who your members are, who's everybody, you know, who everybody. It's it's wall-to-wall SAP is kind of hard to find. So I would say the one big difference I see is there's a lot more ability to talk about non Yeah, and, and some of that is a some of that is a messaging difference as well. Yeah. Right. No, because 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 a lot of that is stuff that SAP can do, but they tend to emphasize other things. They do a great um, job. But um they, they but, do but, yeah, I don't think, anyone else, I think. I don't think anyone else does a better job serving right. opportunity. I think they just I, don't market it that way. I think that the AI conversation needs to be about how artificial intelligence, whether it's generative AI or the other definite flavors of it can help us make better decisions, faster decisions, more holistic decisions, it's not going to be a massive replacement of human capital. I was reading, I'm reading a book right now. It's a fascinating book uh, by Nate Silver. Uh, He talks a lot about poker and he's a, you know, he's Mm -hmm. part of the New York Times and, you know, 538. And, you know, the comment that was made in this book that really struck me is they did studies of high velocity Wall Street traders, right? And they looked at them and they were trying to manage their body chemistry. And what they learned is the way that they approach risk, that kept their body chemistry, their testosterone levels heightening, their dopamine levels heightening, actually helps them make better decisions instead of make worse decisions. That part of that, that ability to just rely on your gut instinct sometimes really helps in the decision-making process. And what that was like in dot, 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 no AI tool can replace body chemistry. And I thought to myself, that's an interesting thing that I never thought about. We discount that. We discount that. But going back to our you know, early caveman days, when you either got a fight or flight, there's a lot of body chemistry involved in that. And you're making high velocity decisions very, very quickly. And there's no AI that can replicate that. And Danny can make Kahneman scientific say, answers. Yeah. Danny Kahneman would say, you're, you know, but we make really bad gut 
calls all the we, time. we can sometimes make really bad gut calls but our our legacy has been ba- also been based on making really good gut calls agreed again right. coming back to my pre- my premise that i think these tools and technologies can do an awesome job of helping us be better decision makers but we keep going to this replacement methodology that they'll replace us and i just don't see it yeah and but but you will see messaging that implies that, and that's one of the yes. With, and I think it's a that's, mistake. That's one of the that's one of the problems with the AI agent emphasis is that it's it's an overemphasis on on automation, and I think it's a misread of what customers are looking to hear right now, which is how can we help you, like you said, Jeff, do your job better, make better decisions, things like that. And 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 in terms of the Daniel Kahneman is very interesting because the AI of today is really best equipped to help with those quick decisions by being another reliable voice of tr- of hopefully trusted information that you can use utilize in those decisions the type of AI that would help with the longer more sophisticated planning functions of the of the second type of slower thinking doesn't okay. exist yet fully and that's what a lot of AI scientists are interested in that are not part of the enterprise discussion but that's a whole other topic so okay so this how was many of I, of of us have had a, a wonderful interaction with a chat bot that we've gone, oh my God, that was so amazing. I'm glad I didn't talk to a human. Or how many of us are in the middle of the chat box? Please escape me out of this hell. Agent, agent. Well, agent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Agent. Well, the, well, it was funny too, because I, I was making fun of a, 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 a projection by a vendor that said 80% of support deliveries are going to be handled by, by bots completely, like, like resolved. And um, they didn't have a projection, I don't think, in terms of years, but I was like, I don't even think I'm at one percent yet, and you're saying eighty. Like, l- l- let's get to five percent and then get back with me. But a lot of the framing, and I've written about this on Diginomica, is like is around productivity, which I think is totally the wrong framing. It's a, it's again, it's a mechanistic, disempowering framing. And in fact, as Josh knows, IT's impact on productivity is is highly questionable in many cases. In the first place, it's very hard to overcome. So, all right. I want to I want to revisit some of those topics, but we'll get to it in the context of TechIt because we now have on our plate a typical SAP news guide with way too many news stories for us to possibly deconstruct. But we've also had some briefings, and I will say I think SAP did a nice job this week of some good back and forth on their announcements. So I enjoyed that. What's your takeaways, folks? What what do you what do you think is going to be interesting in terms of TechEd news developments? What's on your mind? Jeff, go for <laughs> it. Yeah, I mean, I'm my God, something. there's just like silence. Like, right. I'm going to say something mean. So you go first. Oh, Josh. No, I'm not going to no. say that. Okay. Honestly, here's what I'm excited about, and and I and I want to I want to be kind because I, I really mean it. I think I think the the growing importance of SAP Build and the ability of SAP to really drive a better experience around getting this stuff right and getting this stuff implemented. Uh, and using the t- some of the inherent technology that SAP has around, you know, around the this kind, of, kind of these fundamentals of apps, extensions, workflows, automations, digital, you know, that that's really good. I like the story. Um, I like the fact that they are they're putting a lot of thought into this. I think it's it's getting a little complicated out there. Jeff and I, you and I talked about this the other day. The, the you know the the toolbox is starting to get all heavy, and you know, a lot of tools. A lot of tools in there, but 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 there's a really there's a really good focus on some of the stuff you're just talking about collaboration, team development. Um, I like it. I like it. I think um, it it begs this question of how do I build ex- extensions? Uh, wind me up, and I'll give you a long lecture on that. But you know, I think there's still some complexity about balance, clean core extensions. But but the tools are there to make to make some smart choices. Um, and- Can I add one very quick thing too, um, which is that uh-huh. I think SAP is continuing, like as far as real positives, is continuing its 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 history of honoring the ABOP investments customers have made. So SAP Build now includes an ABOP framework. They have an ABOP LLM announcement coming. So I really like that SAP has taken those ABOP investments really seriously because there were a few years there where they were kind of flirting with web languages and we kind of lost track of ABOP just a little bit in terms of the future. So I think that's really smart. They've done a good job with that. Yeah. So l- enough about technical debt. Let's talk about the amazing changes and the updates we're making to ABOP and your ability to code it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you're all ready for TechEd, man. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> I Josh is choking. <laughs> I, I'm choking. I'm all choked up. I'm all choked up. I take two things away. Uh, the first one is we've always said that this whole thing of AI is the worst it's ever going to be. And I think we continue to see that it's getting better and better every time and the tool set is getting more sophisticated and it's getting better and better at being able to do things we need it to do. So I think that's a massive thumbs up. Um, I think that uh, one of the hidden gems in BTP is the ability for you to be able to play around with multiple LLMs. And I, I don't hear us talking about this enough, and I think this is very interesting. I can get into uh, a BTP environment and I can play around with a number of different LLMs and figure out which ones of those are going to help me get to the results I need from a business perspective without having to go out and independently contract with every single one of them. And in the announcements that SAP is making as part of TechEd, they're, they're announcing a broader range of LLMs you can tap into. And I think that's absolutely positively the right way to go. I think that's super cool. So, you know, those things together, I think, are, are reasons why there's a lot to be to really like about TechEd. And then obviously there are the obligatory use cases and those types of things. The one area where I still think we need to do better, where SAP can do better, where the partners can do better, where we as customers need to drive more and demand more is how we're going to use these AI tools to help us get to the next generation of software faster, more predictably, with higher qualities, less time and less cost. So how can we use these tools to tell us where we can take technical debt out remove customizations, help us understand that our data gets mapped into the new environments correctly, automate testing so that we don't have to rely on people to tell us looks good until we migrate and it doesn't, right? So how can we use these tools to help IT deliver a better product faster? I, I have to jump in on that because I, I actually, this is something I, I gave a talk to Philip Persick and his team recently about. And who's Philip? <laughs> Mr. Mr. Herzig. Chief AI. Chief yeah. AI officer. Man. Right. Uh, Chief AI officer. And and that was interesting because, Jeff, you and I think alike. I mean, I said, you know, you want a moonshot that's really going to be the killer, you know, one of the killer cases for, for your great AI tool set. Go after implementation problems. Go after these questions about how do I do a better job. We know, actually, one of the things that LLMs do a pretty decent job with is, is coding. That, you know, they're, they're, yeah. it's a more, it's it's a much more, you know, objective, uh, you know, d definitive, declarative world. Um, and, and I think there's a growing sort of, you know, AI ops mentality. And I would really love to see SAP out in front of this a little bit more uh, because I think there's a, there's a great opportunity. The business transformation suite and that tool set already does a decent job of sort of thinking that way. There's some great data. You're not going to get crap data out of it. It's the data model is, is it's a small language model in a sense. It's it's there to so I think I think that's hopefully you know something we'll we're going to see soon because I think it's let, a great opportunity. Let me throw a bunch of quick bullets out at you guys that I took from the briefings, and you can comment on the ones you want to. I thought um, some of the people coming into the call I think have wildly overhyped notion of of automating code with AI, and I thought um, I believe it was Herzig on one of our calls um, that was that was I think much more reasonable because he. They asked how much benefit can we really expect? And he said, you know, up to like around 30%, which is a much more reasonable, I think, and, and sober understanding of like the complexities of enterprise grade development. It's not some 100x kind of miracle cure that we see on X all the time. And so I, I applaud SAP for sharing real like data on that and not, and not hyping it up too much. Um, the other thing is that SAP committed to Juul. Uh, the interactive copilot into 80% of all uh, the main transactions, 80%, the main ones by the end of the year. So that's going to be interesting to watch in the context of next year as more customers get experience with the product. When I asked the question about in one of the calls around, I actually asked it today in the tech call around um, just that question around the use of AI tooling around imp implementation and migration. I'm getting at least decent answers for SAP that they're looking at that and looking at how to apply that. I'd like to hear even more details, but things that were discussed included things like the improved RISE methodology around automating some of that, which refers to the business transformation toolkit that you're, that you're talking about, Josh, as well mm -hmm. as ABOP Copilot. SAP is like 
getting better answers than I had a year ago to that question, but there's a lot more to do there. Um, and, you know, but AI is pretty good at some of the stuff around pattern recognition. And so it, you know, identifying problem code and things like that, that's stuff that you can sick AI on. And so hopefully we'll hear more about that. So those are some of the things that, um, that jumped out at, at me from the, from the announcements. I mean, there's like, like I said, there's like a 14, 15 page briefing book. So it'll be interesting. There was some interesting chat around like agents talking with other agents and they already announced right. bi-directional integration with Microsoft Copilot. But like, you know, customers aren't going to want to hear with this automated stuff like, oh, sorry, but we hit a wall because some of the data is in Salesforce or some of the data is somewhere else. They want, they just want the processes to work. So are these agents going to be able to talk to each other and, and how is that going to work? And so it'll be really interesting to see if they get into some of those details during their announcements this week. Hey, yeah. John, I have a question for you. Yeah. Can, can AI bots generate technical debt? Well, they can generate bad code. Process so, debt. So yeah. They're process, they are process debt. They're yeah, I was, bad. I was, tr I was trying to be funny and that landed really badly. Because <laughs> we take you too seriously. Because, uh, uh, yeah. Well, sorry. The, a conversation can, about AI can inherit technical debt very quickly. I can tell you that. I don't know if that counts. Um, you know, uh, a couple things about this, you know, that I think are also worth mentioning. Number one is I don't think SAP is being as clear as it needs to be about where you need to be in the software stack in order to take advantage of these various different AI tools. So, well, yeah. you know, uh oh, Ooh, maybe uh -oh. finally, finally, Josh, are you finally agreeing with me today? You're not, you're going to jump with me, not on me over something? Oh, my man, I'm going to throw you on my back and we're both going to jump off. I'm, I'm I've won. It, you know, you need to be pretty far down the stack or pretty current on the stack to take advantage of some of this. And I fear that most of our customers are not, or most of the community is not as far along as SAP says. With that said, I know SAP does plan to downport these things further down, but they're, they're playing true to their comment that they said a, a while ago that these innovations are first going to be available in those running the latest version of software, which we right. understand, right? Yeah. And it makes perfect sense. But how do you get us there faster? They're not they're not downporting all of it though. I can tell no. you the, I can tell you in the press conference today, there was very strong talk again from Herzig, and I've published stuff on this in the past, how how cloud act and, and AI is very connected in, in, in AI's and SAP's view of the world. It's not like yeah. it's not like if you're not on the latest, you won't be able to do anything. But the way that SAP is handling AI is really tied to their Especially Gen AI is really tied to their 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 cloud releases and their rise and grow initiatives and 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 look no further than the way they're pricing a lot of that. Now, not all of their AI will cost additional price, but when it does, it will come out of credits. And my understanding is that credit system is tracked within rise and grow. If if I'm wrong, SAP let me know, but that's my understanding. So the one thing I will say is that this week we did hear more that satisfied me that they are going to do more like for on-premise customers around updating functionality. And they will do that where they can. They're just saying that they, with a lot of AI stuff, it's not going to be that way. Now, some there are some exceptions, like through BTP, you can do some cool stuff. Uh, you, can, you can access a Gen AI hub, for example, through BTP. But it's going to be very interesting for SAP because, Jeff, to some extent, they are gambling a little bit on their strategy. So I'll just give you one example. I was listening to a, a webinar from Cohere, which is a pretty interesting enterprise LLM player, and they're more than happy to step into an on-premise customer and customize a, a language model for them and their purposes and stuff like that. So, and, and they're not the only one. They're just, I mean, Josh, I you, you, you documented yeah. like, you, Josh, you documented like a whole slide presentation about this kind of stuff. So it's going to be an interesting thing because SAP is kind of saying the future is, is, is cloud and AI. And and I think that's right to a large extent, but then there's also customers that can do cool AI stuff if they have quality data, even if they're running on-prem systems. So it's going to be fascinating to see how this plays out. And it's more, more importantly, it's, it's going to be a question of how creative can you be as a customer, part particularly a customer like a lot of your, your members, Jeff, who are running very complex systems and can't, they're just not going to migrate wholesale to S4 HANA Cloud tomorrow. And there are, there are a lot of ways <clears throat> to build sidecar S4 HANA on, you know, systems that allow you, give you access to AI features. It, there's the, yep. the problem, and I, you know, I've discussed this with, with people all up and down the, you know, the executive team at SAP. The problem is that Rise is, Rise is be, being a little too restrictive in how it's 
allow what it's saying to customers who have complex landscapes and can't move tomorrow to full bore on you know on premise. I'm sorry, uh, uh, cloud systems. If SAP doesn't loosen it up, these things up, it's got you know it's got everybody, IBM and your you know your cohere folks, really glad to do this for SAP. What's but what's more important is there are customers today. Who are building these hub and spoke systems? Who are building these complex hybrid systems that are, that have ECC, that have S4, old S4 HANA, that have modern public and private edition S4 HANA, and are running AI? You can do it. You can get innovation. You have to be creative, and SAP has to let you be creative. And this is my biggest beef with Rise right now: is it's still more, yeah, it's still being too restrictive in in how it and not allowing customers be and their and their account execs to be creative about how do you bring innovation in without having to be wall-to-wall cloud, because that's just not possible for a lot of us. Right. And just very quickly, those who have listened to every single one of our uh, podcasts know how much I've hammered us. Yeah. No, yeah. And and there is a support program for that, by the way. <laughs> but um, but I know how much I've hammered SAP on this point. I'm hearing some improved messaging on this topic. I just want to yeah. say that. Like I I'm, I'm seeing some improved messaging. I'm having some better dialogue on these issues with SAP product leadership as well. Now, I don't think they've solved this and they have some strong positions and in some cases like like with Herzig, I give him credit for being very clear and not mincing words because if that's how SAP really feels about some of that, then they should make that abundantly clear. So I I I want to reward that also, but I, I don't want to throw SAP under the bus for keynotes that haven't happened yet. So let's see how they handle this next week. This will be another crack at the plate for them to have an inclusive message that gives, you know, what we're really talking about is giving customers a chance to 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 experiment with cool stuff without making massive moves and then build some momentum on their innovation products and then look at bigger moves if they're not ready to move yet. And that's really what I'm looking at from SAP for. So. I just think they're, they're, John, to your point, and let me plus one this, clear disclosure about the software revs you need to be on in order right. to use this. So don't don't dangle in front of me a bunch of shiny objects that I go right. ooh-ah at just for me to do another couple hours of research to go, gosh darn it, I can't take advantage of that because I need to be here and I'm there. And, right. and, and me. let me, sh- and, and then, Turn around and say, let me show you a creative way to get you at least partway there. Right. Yeah. So, so um, cre- and, and creative ways include, for example, you can access the Gen AI hub through BTP or alternately the public cloud sidecar innovation thing, right, right. which Josh and I are more enthusiastic about than I think SAP is at the moment, but I think that's also a possibility well, in some cases. And, and so there are creative ways of, of doing that. And so a lot of it is how you include, uh, you know, all of this into into how you frame these issues with your customers to let them know that you you have access to this now and and what I don't want is the classic way of doing this which is work it out with your account exec that's not going to work you need to you need to have public messaging around how to do this right right yeah um the the other thing i would i would put a flashing yellow light on is as we move all of this to btp BTP is a transaction engine that charges to most customers based on the transaction. And that's a massive departure from how most customers have run integration and some of these other things. And so I'm starting to hear a lot of concern being raised by customers that they feel that the cost of running this through a BTP engine far outweighs the benefit or they're staggered to find out how much some of this is really going to cost them to run. So we haven't gotten into today licensing and costing and right. business case. But the other thing that kind of comes out of this is all of these are amazing. They're amazing innovations until you say, how much is this going to cost? And you compare that against the budget you have and you go, oh, goodness gracious, we are way out of line. We tend to think all of this is free or would like it to be free, and it is not. And that's where I'm going to throw some caution up. That we yep. need to do some as customers some fairly careful budget and cost benefit analysis and make sure that what we're doing, what we're developing is actually affordable. One of the things I liked about, um, I, I'm, I've been critical of SAP's pricing on AI versus its competitors, and I'm not going to change that. But the one thing I did like, though, is when Herzig was talking about it this week, he talked about how when they do have pricing for AI, 
it, there'll be times where it's included, but when it's not, they're going to also project what the business outcome to expect from that is. And I like that kind of thinking. Now, that's, that's sometimes going to be tricky to realize, but it gets a little bit to your point, Jeff, which is the stuff is not cheap. Now, there's a lot of things being done to reduce the cost of it, and that's a longer conversation, including smaller models and different elaborate technical things that, 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 that make more efficiencies in how models run. But the point is, it's expensive, and you know someone's got to pay for that. But if you're getting an ROI around it, that's a big positive. Then there's, of course, the ESG and sustainability considerations. But okay, so so here's the interesting thing is that we have we're going to have this flood of tech ed news and then tech ed bangalores are obviously going to happen. But I think for a lot of folks what's going to happen is that they're going to need to then process the news cuz Jeff you just raised some points that I don't think are going to get answered in the virtual sessions next week because there are nuanced points around how do I absorb this functionality? Well, it just so happens there's an event coming up, ASUG Tech mm-hmm. Connect where we can come and ask questions like that, and you better have the answers. No, I'm just kidding about that last Me part. Me personally? Uh, <laughs> but, um, but anyway, I think it's interesting, it's interesting to think about that because I think there's a broader conversation beyond just Tech Connect, which is that Tech Ed really used to be a community-centric event, and now, and don't worry, I'm not about to get arrested. Um, I, I was there, wondering what was happening in the background, John. Yeah, like, I would have you know, muted out, coming... but I'm talking. <laughs> what, what's really weird is there's one going on behind me, too. I don't know if you can hear that. They're coming from yeah, I keep hearing it, and it's in stereo yeah. in my headphones. I'm like, uh-oh. I so. hope it doesn't have to do with the NDA I signed for this other vendor last week. Okay. Anyway, so um, so yeah, so so there's whole there's a whole community conversation because so much, I think, of the benefit of making sense of this happens in a community context on the ground. And then I think that spills over into wonderful virtual interactions as well. But we need to meet in order to make sense of all of this. And so that's we could have a much longer conversation around how to foster that community amongst developers and everything else. But I'm thinking in particular about Tech Connect and the goals for this year. And seriously, Jeff, are we going to be able to come to Tech Connect and and have heart to hearts about these kinds of issues? And what are we going to learn? How are we going to answer these questions? Uh, John. I absolutely hope so, because that's what Tech Connect is here to do. It's here to make sure that we can have these face-to-face conversations, we can have honest dialogue, we can learn from each other. And I think, you know, what SAP is going to do virtually is incredibly important. But I think as human species, we need the ability to talk to one another, bounce ideas off of one another, be part of a community, you know, the ASUG bedrock pillars of connect, learn, grow. Right. And you can't connect. I don't think you can connect adequately online. Yeah, you can do some of it, but that ability to have these conversations, you know, in sessions, outside of sessions, in the evening is unparalleled. So I think the combination of everything that SAP is going to provide in at Tech Ed online, coupled with what we're going to do in West Palm Beach, Florida, November uh, 12th through the 14th, is essential. And I think you made a really good point. You're going to see this, you know, at Tech Ed. Take a couple of weeks to digest it, and then you can go and do something in person. Uh, registration and interest is sky high. Um, you know, we're already well past where we started last year, so that's encouraging. And I can't think of a better place to go to get you know real answers from your peers, from SAP and the partner community. And by the way, I think both of you are going to be there. So, you know, I, I would encourage our listeners to hunt both of you down and ask some of these questions. Josh, not so much from you because you're just, you know, you start on these tirades. I'm just going to just talk about it, how much I hate AI. I'm, I'm going to walk up to say, hey, Josh, let's talk about AI. And it's going to be like, ah. No, no, but Josh, away. let's talk about enterprise architects. Let's talk about enterprise architects. I want to so, get, I, actually, I want to get to that in just a sec. But you, you, can, you, can jump, you can jump into that, Jeff. What am I, well, what, am I missing anything on, on Tech Connect? Because both of you have been huge advocates as well. So. This notion of getting back to pure community. One of the things that I heard over and over again last year when we did Tech Connect version one in New Orleans was this feels like what I remember Tech Ed used to be. And people were so thankful that we invited them in and they could get back to that. And so we're trying to recreate that again this year. We're very conscientious about that. The team has done a tremendous job on it. Uh, you know, so I, I think there's a lot of upside and it, it's at a time of year where you can use it to wrap up 2024 and be ready for 20 and get ready. Yeah. So do this before the quarter's over, you know, and I think you're setting a nice table, you know, for this, these conversations. I mean, looking at the, 
<clears throat> the sort of the, the, the topic areas, you know, application development, automation, analytics, architecting business transformation. I mean, system operation. This is this is the meat and potatoes of how do you trans translate, you know, software. I want to I want to get I want to get to enterprise architects for our yeah, final. Like, Never mind. Yeah. Just I want to I want to get to that in the final section. But before that, I want to tell Jeff. Uh, what my expectations are. I'm, I'm putting on my customer hat, although technically I'm not totally an SAP customer unless you want to count TripIt, which is part of Concur. Yeah, I have to use a repo. I am a yeah, customer. <laughs> yeah, I am a paid, paid TripIt customer. So. Okay, here's what I expect putting on my customer hat, Jeff. You, you, you can tell me if you think you're going to be able to deliver on this. Uh-oh. Provide expert peer guidance and, and data on us for HANA migrations, which includes industry stories, skills, resource planning, partner selection, all that stuff. Yeah. Help help me place S4 HANA and S, S, SAP priorities into my industry specific transformation because some of these migrations are more technical, but I need to understand where my industry is headed and, and what other my peers are, are thinking about. Sort of, but there's something else that's happening in two weeks that's better at that than what you just described. ASUG best practices event. Yes. Right. Yep. Okay. Uh, help companies understand SAP's AI and innovation strategy and access cost to that innovation because innovation access will vary based on my software footprint. Absolutely. Yes. Provide a broader context to AI readiness, how members are preparing for AI and building use case momentum both inside and outside of SAP, given this is a generational shift in how employees approach work and automation. Yes. I, I like the hesitancy there. It's like, we better no, double down that was on that a one. Huge sentence. It wasn't like three okay. words. All right, it cool. was like a so paragraph. That was, I threw you for a loop. Then you you say it. that's a strong yes. Then that's okay. a strong yes, John. Okay, despite my verbiage. Okay, and, cool. And, and I'm I'm going to say you know Jeff, I'm just sort of scrolling here, looking at the agenda. Right, there's a lot of really good customer stories too. I mean, you don't don't so, sell short the the notion that you can't talk. You're not going to be talking about industry specific requirements. You got Dow Chemical. You got PepsiCo. You got. Um, uh, who, uh, Sounds like industry. You guys are turning this into a commercial, or no, 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 well, no, 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 no. I'm trying to hit well, on. Actually, yeah, we got to justify why we're going. Well, well, also these questions could be used for anyone who goes to any SAP event, not just not just right. Tech Connect. So I'm trying to share something of deeper value, Jeff. Come on. Um, okay, one more, and then we're going to go into Enterprise Architects because this is where I'm leading you. ASUG Tech Connect, providing the tech leadership and vision to help it, members network and adapt to all of this including SAP's strong talk about enterprise architect commitments and also clean core methodologies are of strong interest, but outside of a sales context. Are we going to be able to get that? Emphatically, yes. Woohoo. Oh, yeah. Emphatic, yes. Okay. So, and, so and both of you have also been involved in the planning of this event. Both of you have been asked and you've been participating with the ASUG teams on content selection and content architectures and all that stuff. So the good news is if I've, if I've misspoken, gonna I'm going to blame the both of you. Oh, throw us under the bus. Gonna, okay, of course, I'm going to go run for the hills. I love it. But I want to talk about enterprise architects. We've, we've covered off Clean Core really nicely. We had a whole um, podcast on that. And I think we're eventually going to do one on enterprise architects as well. Um, but I just wanted to throw this over to Josh first and then, and then to you, Jeff. Why, why is enterprise architect as a role and as a topic really coming up again and again in all these conversations. Why, why do we need to bear down on this one? Well, obviously it starts with, well, it started before this, but the imperative is, is, is really come to, come to the fore lately because this is what, you know, Thomas Zauer, I think, has been, been promising us, as has Christian Klein from the podium, from the, you know, in front of the industry, in front of the financial analyst community. They are going to put a, you know, put an enterprise architect in every pot, uh, every, every, customer is going to get one. I'm not sure how that's going to work. There, I have a lot of questions about it. But the fundamental issue of how do you translate both the business opportunity and the enormous amount of technical complexity into something that actually works both as a clean core and as an innovation center for your company, that's hard. And you're going to need, you know, I think this, this role, and it's a, it's a, Jeff, you and I have talked about this just recently. John, you and I have talked about this extensively. It's it's complicated because enterprise architect as a as a persona is all over the map. Um, but but the notion that there is this translation job that needs to be happened that you called 
Jeff, you called the other day the keeper of the toolkit. Um, I think I think we need to be able to anchor all this goodness that SAP is providing, this overabundance, quite frankly, of stuff, and, and, and in, into a set of a set of capabilities that then are used to very comp- consciously and comprehensively translate um, the needs of the business into an actual working system. Because this is just more more difficult, more complex, more dynamic than it's ever been. Um, and and I, I like the idea that SAP is focusing on this persona as a as sort of a, a you know a north star, if you will. I'm I, like I said, I'm a little confused about who those people really are, where the skills going to come from, and and you know and how we're going to align and do that alignment. Because boy, there's a lot of moving parts to aligning business to technology needs. A lot. It's a really complicated job these days, right, Josh, to be an enterprise architect. Um, and it's not getting simpler. The architectures are not um, going to be any clearer or conciser as we go forward, right? So to me, I think that those folks who call themselves enterprise architects in today's world have a, have a huge job in front of them. And are trying to understand and synthesize all of this and trying to come up with, you know, some court sort of sense of assembly of order and coherence. You know, John, you you pointed out earlier, right, that, you know, we have data all over the place in various different apps. I mean, one of the things that I worry about is everyone has an AI solution to everything. So we're not in an arena where you get to clarity. If everyone has their own AI and everyone's trying to wall off and silo data all over the place, uh, and you as an enterprise want to get to one specific coherent source of truth across multiple different apps with different structures and different everything. And the enterprise architect is in the epicenter of that. That is a huge job. And so I think they need all the help they can get to kind of navigate that. Agreed. So, uh, Jeff, you've accused me of over sell over marketing ASIC Tech Connect. So this question is directed to the conference, but it can also be interpreted in a more broader way, which is we could spend a whole lot of time navel, navel gazing at a show like that over how do we even define this role. There's so many different versions of this role at different companies, and what does this mean to your project? How can we have some productive discussions about that at an event like this, but mm-hmm. avoid getting too bogged down in that so that we're not really also figuring out how to take stuff home that we can use? Like, How are we going to balance that? So um, I was madly texting some members of my team while we were kind of doing this conversation because a light bulb went off in my head and I wanted to make sure that a couple of the key players from SAP who have responsibility and accountability for the enterprise architecture, you know, competency inside of SAP will be at ASUG Tech Connect. And the team is telling me they're supposed to be there, yes. And they're going to verify that they actually have purchased their airline tickets to be there. <laughs> um, so my non, intention non-refund, is non-refundable, non-refundable tickets. one-way tickets. We're here as long as you need us for. <laughs> Excellent. Um, you know, with the intention that I think this is where some of these conversations can occur. Uh, I I think that SAP. I'm going to let me separate out two things. What SAP is doing around technical and around enterprise architects to me is a very different motion than what we as customers need to do around enterprise architecture. And I don't want to cross-wire the two because uh, I'm a little bit more confused about why SAP all of a sudden is having this interest in technical architects and enterprise architects. To me, it sounds, and Josh and I got into this earlier this week, sounds like a, a, new, a new way to talk about pre-sales, right? And I don't know how a single enterprise architect from SAP can possibly comprehend and understand the enormity of the SAP product suite and juxtapose that and and re- and you know reconcile that against all the customers they have accountability and responsibility for. I don't know how that works, right? But I want to talk about enterprise architects inside of our customer base. They are essential to the future success of of artificial intelligence moving to a you know a new clean core world. They they have to understand this clearly and succinctly so that their enterprises make the right decisions. Because making the wrong decisions is costly in time, quality, and of course, dollars. I totally agree. And, and I think one of the reasons why this role is becoming, in my opinion, c- critically important, even more so than in the past, is because everything I've studied about AI indicates to me that 
there's such a divide between consumer AI and enterprise AI. So you talked about a chatbot never giving you a satisfying response. Well, on the consumer side, that's totally different because there's a lot of people that are having, I don't want to say adult, but romantic relationships and interactions with chatbots. They're, they're people that are having friendly discussions with chatbots. Like there's all kinds of sat- satisfying chatbot interactions friends. on the consumer side. But the beauty of that setup, regardless of whether it's something that you would be interested in or I, is the fact that you don't have to tie that to a, 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 a core set of data and, and precision output. It's more about being chatty and enjoying the time and, you know, doing stuff like everyone can relate to when the tool first came out of like, you know, give me ASUG's mission statement in the form of a Shakespearean sonnet. And it can do that, you know, and that's super fun, you know, um, whether it has any business value, I think we could probably debate that. So yeah, unless you're going to be reading a sonnet at, at Tech Connect, which I doubt. So um, I will it, not. Anyhow, so I think I think in the Let enterprise, me compare you to a summer day. Yes. Yeah. So in the enterprise context, it's all about customer specific data and customer specific results, and there's no one better suited for that than an enterprise architect to help design that kind of data architecture in a way that has integrity to that company and that company's compliance needs and everything else. And like you said, no one from SAP can come into every single company and understand that unique company's culture and how to make all of that work. And so I think this topic is super important and I'm really looking forward to seeing what what uh, ASUG Tech Connect can deliver on this topic because I think it's an important part of what's going to go down there. So I, I, I'm in the process of finishing for ASUG News a big, a big piece on the enterprise architect. Opportunity, big. Cool. It's actually, yeah, it's sort of like a little too much in a way. But one of the things I'm doing at the end of it is really, you know, kind of what is the call to action? And I want to sort of say this in this podcast, I think it's really worthwhile. It's going to be really important for customers to nurture, nurture the, the enterprise architect community inside their companies and find it, grow it, <laughs> train it, retain it, uh, make them happy. These, these resources are going to be super important. You're, you know, the, every, every global SI go, you know, has, has, a, has a call out for anybody with an enterprise architect background. They're going to hire them at you know, good, incredibly expensive salaries. Um, the the membership of ASUG really has to, you know, focus. I think on also looking inward and making sure these resources are are you know are being, you know, are being captured and and trained up and and you know and and taken good care of because you're going to need just as you said, Jeff, you're going to need that inside view in of of your architecture that an outside consultant isn't going to be able to provide. Um, so I'm 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 sort of really excited about. You know, some of the stuff I'm seeing at Tech Connect really does specifically say, "Hey, enterprise architects over here, let's let's talk to you." And I think um, that's going to be a very important effort inside companies as well to say, "Hey, let's gather our our you know existing and prospective architect community inside and and keep you know keep them up up and running because we're going to need them desperately uh, over the next few years." I took a picture yesterday at a from a customer who's making a presentation on AI, and they said this, they said, data is a food for AI, take care of it. And I think that this is a critical, it's a simple, it's a simple sentence, but it's, it's right at the core of this, right? And John, you pointed this out a few minutes ago. If you really want to get value from AI, it starts with data. And if you don't have the data, you're not going to get value from AI. And if your data is all over the place and it's contradictory and it doesn't make any sense and it, you know, X is Y and Y is Z and Z is A. And then it's never going to, and this idea that AI is going to invent answers based on data you don't have is largely permitting hallucinations to occur. And then therefore saying, I can really make bad decisions based on my AI outcome because it hallucinated and I'm not accountable for it, which is not true, right? We're supposed to be inventing and, and relying on AI to help us make better decisions, not worse ones. And the data model matters, and the people in the organization that have to be thinking about that data model and what it means is the enterprise architect. Bingo. Okay. Well, for sorry, Josh, can you make it really fast because I want to wrap this? So, is there anything else you have to say? Or no, nope, okay, I'm cool. done. Okay, cool. So, uh, for those of you who made it to the end, there is no door prize. Sorry, uh, but uh, but I will say Us. for the yeah, there there is that the banter, right? But uh, feel free to get in touch with us. There's topics you want us to cover in our next roundup. And I am sure that we will revisit the Enterprise Architect discussion, probably post-Tech Tech Connect, because I think 
that's a potent one to flesh out a little further than we have today. So with that, I'm going to ask each of the guys to go and I like this calls to action concept. So let's let's leave listeners with a couple of calls to action for the upcoming events they may be attending. For example, Josh, you and I will also be at SAP Spend Connect, and then I have a flurry of non-SAP events as well, and you have some other travels. So anyway, events coming up, including Tech Connect and other stuff. What are your calls to action for folks? And my calls to action are going to be, as an individual, as you consume this content, I, I would hope for you to find the right balance between your professional development and your corporate team needs and find that right balance that I'm always struggling to find between curiosity of the really good stuff that's happening and the critical thinking that is really necessary right now because sometimes every vendor, including SAP, goes over the top with some statements that I think need fleshing out. And a lot of times they can flesh them out, but keep in mind that critical thinking and find that right balance, and I think you'll be in good shape. Who's next? Jeff, I anoint you. Oh, thank you. Um, take key takeaways. This environment is moving very fast and the only way to stay on top of it, or even if you can, even if you can, and some days I think I'm, I'm slipping, um, is to listen to these types of things and to engage and to, you know, show up at events and not just to listen, but also to contribute back. And so, you know, John, as you're talking about, you know, where should SAP people spend their time? Go to Tech Connect in a couple weeks in West Palm Beach. Pay attention to what's being said at TechEd virtually. Uh, engage inside your community. Connect, learn, and grow. I, 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 this is essential. I learned so much more by listening to people talk about these things. And you know, sometimes to me, I, I'm a. You guys all know that I have a lot of energy, and it's very difficult for me to sit still for a long period of time. But I walk out of all of these conferences that I'm at, and I I think I I know a lot more than when I went in, and that's just spits slowing down long enough to listen to what others have to say. And I, I, I like what you just said, Jeff, and I'll just add that I think, you know, for, for customers coming into the, these conferences, whether it's, you know, Spend Connect, which is very more domain specific or Tech Connect, which is going to be very uh, technology specific, um, really having a, both a, set, a solid sense of what you're, what you're looking for and kind of where you are and where you want to go. And then I would say also standing your ground. I mean, there's, you know, when someone says to you, and particularly with mm-hmm. someone in sort of a salesy kind of orientation says, well, this thing is going to solve your problem, challenge it. Ask for the ROI analysis. Ask for the real data. Tell me the customer where this worked. Not, and not a, don't tell me about a proof of concept. I want, you know, I want the real deal. Because I think we separating the POC fantasy from the, you know, working reality is going to be really important because, for most of us, you know, and I'm speaking, putting my customer hat on, for most of us, we need to actually get the job done today. And, you know, down the road, two years from now, five years from now is a nice fantasy, but there's, there's, there's a real business reality that needs to be dealt with now. So I, I would say stick, stick to your ground in terms of being, keeping everyone, everyone grounded in, in reality and, and, and ask for, you know, ask for the, the numbers. Don't just go, oh, yeah, this is cool. Yeah, I think it would be really interesting. I love what you guys just said. And it'd be super interesting instead of just looking at like, what did I learn at this event or this webinar or this, these series of events? Who did I meet and deepen connections with that can, that I can help in the future and that can help me, right? Like not just what did I learn, but who did I connect with and, and how can I take this forward? And, and also how can I share what I've learned, right? That, that I think a lot of people think, well, you know, this all AI generated content. Well, we still crave human insight. And you're never too early in your journey to start sharing, you know, whether it's on the ASUC site or, you know, LinkedIn or your, wherever you feel like doing it, you know, like start that journey because it's amazing. Like, I think a lot of us met each other in the process of doing that, right? You know, like just sharing our thoughts and ideas was a great way to foster that. And I think if you look at it like that, you can guide yourself these changes. I don't like your chances in isolation. <laughs> there you go. Good end. Good end point. All right. Thumbs up. We're totally out, guys. Agree. Thanks. Till next Thank time. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Good to see you all. Bye.